I promised to do something rather different today and it might not turn out to be that way. What I wanted to do was a little bit more of a relaxed talk about this subject because it needs to be done in a very relaxed way. So if we were to go back to the 1st of July 1935 and you were in Germany and you were an archaeologist, you had two choices either join the SS and be indoctrinated as an SS archeologist, <coughs> and you would become a member of the Ananurbe, or you would no longer be in that profession. So teaching you today, I would have no choice. Now, the reason why we start off with the Ananurbe is the subject that we're just about to look at. It's a very unusual subject in that over the years, more and more evidence has come to light of very early origins in Germany. Now that evidence of early origins in Germany has been with us since the 1980s. Slowly but surely, the evidence has been growing that we have to look at a multi-regional approach in regards to human evolution. So it's very useful when we were looking at Peking man and we were looking at the Aboriginals and the other intimations I've been making about multi-regional development of humanoids that we actually come here today. So I've got to state first that I believe in a multi-regional model. I do not believe that all humanoids developed from Africa. I will make that clear. I believe that human beings today are a mix of various hominid types that once existed singularly on this planet. So in other words, we're talking about just Homo erectusines, Homo sapien Neanderthals, Denisovians, Heidelbergensines, Homo sapiens sapiens. So at one point, all of these diverged into modern hominids. There is not just one single lineage for human beings on this planet. We have to look at the Ananurbe and the impact of German science in the Second World War and leading up to the Second World War. And it could be said to be very dangerous for me to say that we've got human evolution as one of the strands to modern humans developing in Germany, but the evidence is all for us to see. This is not something that started off with the Ananurbe, trying to prove a superior race once existed. But one thing that I will agree with in regards to the Ananurbe is that their thoughts of a higher race developing in the Northern Hemisphere. The Ananurbe were set to task to seek for an advanced race coming from the north. And they didn't really find that evidence, but over the past two decades, it's been turning out that the evidence in Orkney of highly advanced ceramic culture, early forms of settlement, early forms of animal husbandry, early forms of crop rotation, building of stone circles, that originates in the north. It doesn't originate in Europe, it originates in the north on Orkney. And that is, all, that is for us all to see. So the Ananurbe actually had it right without knowing that they had it right. So that's the first thing. The Germans did not know that there was any way 
that human evolution in one strand of the human lineage today could have ever begun in Germany. But they had known this. It would have added more to their pantheon to say that the German race is a superior race. And it would have been very um, damaging to various populations in Europe if they, if they had known that back then. Can you imagine in Adolf Hitler's speeches saying that the part of the human race evolved in Germany, how, how excessive that would be to German policy leading up to the Second World War and the final solution. So even though we're saying that we now know that we've got large numbers of fossils of hominids in Germany dating back to 47 million years ago, earlier than hominid remains in Africa. It's good that we've got that evidence today and it's brilliant that that wasn't found in Germany before the Second World War. It would have, would have had a great impact on, uh, on, on German propaganda. You can imagine it now, but so the reason why I want to start off with this, it's not a talk about the Ananurbe, it's not a talk about how brilliant the Germans are or anything like that. This is a seminar about human evolution. And I will say that we've got human evolution in Africa, human evolution in Germany, human evolution in Asia. I will say that. And all these diverge into the very cosmopolitan human species that we find around us today. So the other point that has to be made is, the, is by looking at the biased nature of Western archeologists. One or two of you, names shall not be mentioned, have worked in academic circles directly with archeologists. And you'll know a number of things. Lots of archeologists don't agree. Some archaeologists that don't agree have a bloodlust for other archaeologists and they'll do anything to try and destroy their careers. Archaeology is a very nasty profession to actually be in. And when one archaeologist says that they're right, they will always be right to their grave. And no matter what evidence comes out of, of China, no matter what evidence comes out of Australia, Europe, Germany, people will always say, that we all evolve from one single strand out of Africa. They will never be convinced of anything else. So the problem is what we're seeing today is evidence. You can believe that evidence because it's in black and white. Maybe there might be one of you today that goes away thinking, actually, Carl's wrong. All the evidence he's shown us today is fantasy. Can't prove any of it. And I believe that it's out of Africa. When I discussed this introduction on, on Tuesday, one of my group on Tuesday, he said, I've never believed for one moment that we've all evolved out of Africa. I've always felt that we've, as humans, have developed out of other areas of the planet as well as out of Africa. This thing about Western archeologists, if this evidence had been found in Germany, say 1946, by non-right-wing Ananurbe archeologists, British and American archeologists would dismiss the evidence, just as they dismiss the evidence in regards to Peking Man. Peking Man was the oldest fossil remains found on the planet before Lucy was found in the Old Divide Gorge in the late 1950s, 1960s. They dismissed that evidence. They would certainly dismiss the German evidence and they dismiss the German evidence today. It cannot be multi-regional, some of these archeologists say. We have to be developed out of Africa, which in itself is very racist, is very, is very wrong, is very fixed, fixed in their ways. And I don't agree with those archaeologists. Again, I go with a multi-regional model. I could stand up in a lecture against one of these up themselves, white-skinned, racist archaeologists that archaeologists 
is full of. And I, no matter what evidence I would present, they would find a counter argument and say that we come out of Africa. And it's a very dangerous time that we live in, in regards to all the protest movements. For me to go into an area that I believe it's out of various different areas of the planet. But it's not those who were born in Africa that want to go out and say that, you know, we've developed out of Africa. It's actually Western archaeologists saying that we've developed out of Africa. To be honest with you, when we look at the cosmopolitan nature of society that we live in today, it suits the undercurrent to say that we're out of China, out of Africa, out of Germany, other places on the planet. But there will be those that will use the out of Africa model for their own ends and for their own racist ends. That's not what we're gonna to do today. So a few months ago, November, somebody brought in an article and I think I actually do think it was Kathy. And she brought in an article and it was a statement. Primate apes found in Germany. And if anyone can remember my reaction that day, I think I used the words, I am speechless. And everybody in that room said, that's unlike you, Carl. I was speechless that day. I was shocked. <clears throat> because even though I'd felt it, even though I believed it, I didn't really have much evidence of out of anywhere else other than out of Africa. It's one of those nut jobs that were saying that we must have evolved elsewhere. But now we had the evidence. However, one thing that we weren't being told in that article was that in the 1980s, other primate remains have been found in Germany. Other primate remains known as Darwinius Massili. Darwinius Massili. And she, yes, she was found 1983, dating back, wait for it, not 100,000 years ago, not even close, not 12, 000, not 12 million years ago, not even close. These remains date back to 47 million years ago, and they were found in Germany, modern day Germany, in 1983. But what happened to those fossils is a bit of a tragedy. Yes, they were finally reunited, but those remains were found by a human collector. Are you still with us, Goff? Goff isn't with us. Oh, you're still with us, that's good. So we're now looking at uh, Germany as it is today. And all the way across Germany, do we find finds associated with early primates? But we've got to talk about the Neander Valley, which we'll be doing at the end. Germany's always been a place of finding evidence of hu early human origins. Back to that Anna Nerbe bit again. I may have mentioned already in another lecture that Adolf Hitler was not keen on the Anna Nerbe. He was not keen on Heinrich Himmler's proclamation to find the early origins of this superior race. Adolf Hitler wasn't keen on it. It's, um, there's, there's transcripts to say that Adolf Hitler said to Himmler one day, by looking for trying to find our early origins in Germany to try and find this superior race. How am I supposed to face the wider world saying that us Germans had battens and clubs when we had whole Roman legions marching into Germany at the time with armor and far superior technology than us? How am I supposed to face that? How am I supposed to give speeches about your findings when they're nothing like what Mussolini past was like. So that they, on this backdrop, what we see in history is that this Anna Nurbe, this, this research that was being done, 
was not approved of by Adolf Hitler himself. However, back to what I've just said a few moments ago, before Germany in the Second World War, before the First World War, before the war between France and, and, and Germany in, in 1871, in 1856, in the Neander Valley, we've got the earliest evidence of pre-modern hominids found anywhere on the planet in the Neander Valley. Germany, way before the propaganda of the um, leading up to the Second World War, way before mm. all that. So Germany has been the place of the finding of early hominids for a very, very long time. And by the way, 1856, that's 100 years before Lucy in Africa. Why, do pe why are people obsessed with having one evolutionary link from Africa? I do not know. There she is, Darwinius Marsile. Darwinius Marsile is believed to be the missing link. She could stand upright. And if we look at this, we look at the digits associated with her hand and look at this creature. Isn't she beautiful? This species would have been no more than two foot in length from tip of tail to head. So it was a small primate, but there are many similarities in regards to modern hominids, modern human beings. What you can clearly see, and if we can move in this a little bit more, I'm hoping to move this up. If we zoom in a little bit more, and we try and, oh, hang on. It'll happen. Good. If we look at it this way, what we're looking at is one of our distant ancestors. And if I draw in here, you can actually see the similarities. Well, obviously we don't have a tail today, but we have the base of a tail. The, the spinal column is very similar to ours. The ribs ain't as big as ours, but in proportion to the body, but a similar number of rib bones. And so, We've got a femur, we've got a tibia and a fibula. We have a humerus, we have an ulna and a radius. And we've got five digits and we've got five digits. The carpals and the tarsals are very similar to ours today. And also you can see the development of a foot that indicates that it could walk upright. Now this is a primate that could walk upright 47 million years ago. Again, 47 million years ago. So what I'd like to do is give you some nice punchy facts. So let's have an image in front of us of what this creature we do believe looked like. But there's one other little fact. Can you see a bit of a dark shadow around the bones? Guess what that is? It's the remains of its flesh and its hair. And guess what? If we go over towards its stomach, there, we know what its last meal was. The only major difference between this animal and us today, forget the tail bit, is actually the skull. Smaller brain cavity, a more, more protruded jawbone and teeth. It's the only major difference actually, and the height as well. So let's look at a little bit of information. To try and clear that. Let's go to this. That you can you can get a good measure. So as I read my notes, keep this in mind. Darwinius Massile. Now, it's good to have Goff with us today. It's known is is named after the village of Messel, which is southeast of Frankfurt, Germany. I probably got the pronunciation wrong, so if anyone wants to correct me on that, that's fine. 
So it's, it's known, it was named after Charles Darwin, naturally, 150 years ago. Um, you've got his, um, you've got his landmark publication where, where we look about the missing links and all the rest of it. So 47 million years ago. And listen to this, the only known fossil called Ida was discovered in 1983 in the Messel pit, a disused quarry near the village of Messel. Well, the fact of the matter is, most of this evidence actually comes from quarry pits. Why am I even making a fuss over that? Well, quarry pits have been very useful. Cliff, cliff faces, quarries and all the rest of it are really useful for finding fossilized remains. Yes, this is a fossil, 47 million years ago. Now, these, these finds, the, this evidence was found by accident. In fact, all the evidence in Germany has been found by accident. Even, in a way, the evidence in the Neander Valley, which was also being quarried at the time. Now, if we went out and sought for evidence across Germany, Spain, France, Romania, Turkey, we would probably find more evidence of early primates in all those localities. In fact, we've got evidence of early hominids in Britain as far back as 800,000 years ago, nearly a million years ago but they've naturally all evolved from apes from Africa. The difference is with the remains that you're looking at today is if you want to compare this with the likes of Lucy, the remains of Lucy that were found, were found um, over 60 odd years ago are not complete. And she only dates from around between 3.5 and 3.2 million years ago. And, and we're just being told that she was one of the earliest upright beings on the planet. Here's one from 47 million years ago in Germany. You'll always see Lucy in textbooks, but you won't see our, one of our relatives here dating back to 47 million years ago. Now, this being found in a disused quarry, Let's tell you a little bit more about that finding, which 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 adds to the story. So let's just um, let's just go down to here. <coughs> the events regarding the original unearthing of the fossil are not clear, though some facts are known. It was found in the Marcel pit in 1983, mm. a disused shale quarry, noted for its astonishing fossil preservation, but this is very unique. The fossil came as a slab, a partial counter slab, and was expertly prepared by encasing each slab in resin using a transfer technique necessary to conserve the Messel fossil. At some point, the slab and counter slab went separate ways. This was actually found by private collectors. That's the problem. The counter slab was incorporated in a composite of um, fabricated parts to represent a complete specimen and arrived at a private Wyoming museum in 1991. Analysis, the Natural History Museum of Basel revealed the mixed, um, the, the mixture, actual and faked nature of this slab. So therefore, this was a forgery. However, the original, not the one in Wyoming, which turned out to be a fake, the original remained in Germany in the, in the possession of a private collector who kept it secret for 20 years before deciding to sell it anonymously via a German fossil dealer. Bloody hell. N 1983. And the world knew nothing about this find. 1983. Early origins. How much more of this evidence is out there? How much more of this evidence to, to go to understand who we are is in private collections. 
two German museums turned it down as too expensive. One of the most important sets of ancestral remains that have ever been discovered. To me, this is far more important than Lucy. I'm talking in a biased way and I shouldn't, but this is complete. It came to light in 2006, 2006. So it's only in the past 14 years that the worldwide community has known about these really early origins coming from Germany. So this, this, this whole story and it is, is a very interesting story indeed. If anyone wants to know where Frankfurt is, it's in south central uh, modern day uh, Germany. So if we, if we give you a little bit more detail, let's give a little bit more detail on this. So it's known, the, the genus um, Darwinus, um, commemorating the bicenary um, of the birth of Charles Darwin. And it, it's to honor Charles Darwin. It's um, the, the author's writing about this, this wonderful being. Uh, refer to it as a transitional form, a link between early primates and the later beings that then develop. So if I go to some other notes as well, this, this, this hominid was actually given a more simple name and we'll give that more simple name. It was actually given the name of Ida, not Ida duck, but Ida. And it's been extensively researched, but there are experts that don't give this set of remains any, any bearing on being part of our human lineage. As a set of early primate remains, 95% of the bones uh, are there. Basically, she she misses one limb, but 90, 95% of the bones are there. Remember, she's 47 million years um, old. By comparison, the famous Lucy fossil, Australopithecus afarensis, is only 40% complete. So this is how amazing this German find is. She was called Ida, was a small primate, about nine months old when she died from end to end as as a babe she is only 58 centimeters at half a meter in length about the size of a small house cat and an adult is believed to have been about two foot in length ida's legs were longer than her arms well yeah, sort of a human characteristic, indicating she was a leaper. X-ray scans show she was a female. Ida's remains also show she had a broken right wrist. She didn't die of a broken wrist, however, but almost certainly contributed to her early death. And that's the problem with bipeds. When you've got when you're seeing more of a use on, on two legs rather than four legs, those two limbs become more important than the four limbs. Ida had large eye sockets, suggesting she was nocturnal. Nocturnal animals are active mainly at night. The shape of Ida's teeth suggests she was a vegetarian. Let's not start that one. I.e. The, the argument between were we actually originally vegetarians or meat eaters. Let's just not go down there. However, scientists didn't have to guess what she ate. Her last meal, her last full meal was of fruit and nuts still preserved in a, a gut millions of years after she ate it. Amazing that. Do we have anything similar for Lucy or do we have anything similar for Homo erectocenes? No. Actually, that's not exactly true. When we've examined Homo erectocene sites, we've got evidence of some of their last meals. So let's take that back. Ida had long fingers and toes, 
and upper opposable thumbs. Her hands show she had rounded fingertips with nails, not claws, just like human hands. Rounded fingertips with nails are classic um, primate features. So this is why she comes down our family line. Scientists from all the way around the world have asked to research this set of primate remains. One of the surprises the paleontologists have found, X-ray and Ida, was that she had many more teeth than the average primate. Now that's interesting. Many more teeth. When the scientists looked closer, they discovered Ida was in the process of losing her baby teeth. Yes, more human she sounds, doesn't she? Unerupted molars, adult teeth that were pushing out her baby teeth could still be seen in her jaw. From this, paleontologists determined Ida was a juvenile primate, not the baby, but not fully adult either. It's likely that the nine months may have represented in equivalent to a human lifespan six years. Developmentally, she was about the same age as one of the archaeologists working on the body. And guess what she was called? Ida. So that's why she's got the nickname. And it's useful she's got this nickname because it's much more easier to remember. Ida, the 47 million year old primate from Germany. And it, it's, it's talking about the, the paleontologist is called Hurm. His daughter, <coughs> Ida, she was actually losing her baby teeth at the time as well. And when she was six years old. So that's why she's given that name. So Ida's scientific name, Darwinius Marsile, <coughs> um, the genus uh, Darwinius was named in honor of Charles Darwin's 200th birthday. And the species Marsile was to commemorate the Messel uh, pit in Germany where Ida was found. Now, to get an idea a little bit more about this hominid, and we might talk about some views that disagree with this, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not sure they're in these notes, but if they are, I'll try and put something in. The Messel Pit is an abandoned quarry, 35 kilometers southeast of Frankfurt. The pit was formed millions of years ago when hot magma bubbling from under the earth came too close to the underground water table. When the magma hit the water table, it instantly turned to steam. Hot air rises, but this air had nowhere to go. The pressure of the steam caused a massive explosion as the hot air tore into the earth. The explosion created a type of volcanic lake known as a ma. Not the word I've ever come across before. And she, it's likely that um, our wonderful Ida fell into the lake. The explosion that formed Messel Lake happened about 50 million years ago. Because Ma had no rivers running in into it or out of it, the water at the bottom of the lake received very little oxygen. Anything that fell into the lake was remarkably well preserved. And so is Ida. They didn't go through the same decom decomposition process that other living things do when they die. Sounds a bit similar to the blue caves in the Bahamas, if you ask me. Another ca characteristic of this type of landscape is that they sometimes spit out toxic gases. And this locality might kill any, any creature that goes near the lake. And a creature forming into the lake, going to its dark, dark depths, preserved our wonderful body. Scientists speculate that this is what killed Ida, the gases. Her parents may have been there and she may have been on the lake side and some gases come up and then it, and she died and she rolled in or something. 
or her broken wrist meant she couldn't leap and cling to high tree branches. Lower to the ground, she encountered the toxic gas in Marcel Lake, lost consciousness and drowned. Nice little story, that. In 2001, a hole was drilled into the center of Marcel Pit. Scientists extracted volcanic rocks that formed the ancient lake. Dating the rocks and the Marcel Pit showed that Ida was about 47 million years old. 47 million years old. Now, when, when Ida lived, this was a period known as the Eocene period, which it lasted between 55 million and 34 million years ago. Eocene is a geological period. The Eocene is an important period in human evolution, human development as we are today. Because it was during this time that the first primates were evolving, about 40 million years ago, there were two distinctive primate groups, the prosimians and the anthropoids. Now, when we, when we look at this, let's give you a little bit of detail. Prosimians and anthropoids, they differentiate the difference between the two by looking at their nose gait. Prosimians have dog-like wet noses. Extant or living representatives of these prosimians include lemurs and bush babies. Anthropoids have dry noses. Just like me. I'm an anthropoid. Anthropoid. We've got dry noses and like monkeys and apes and Humans are also dry nosed primates, so we got dry noses. There we go. At some point during the Eocene, primates evolved into two different branches. So, was either a wet nosed or a dry nosed primate? It's not in this protruding gate because what happens is, is the pursuit, if, if you think about something like this everything starts to come up into a flat face. So our mandible and our flush face seems to go into one. So that's the major difference between Ida and the way we look today. So was Ida a wet nosed or dry nosed primate? That question, that question, that very, very interesting question. Listen to this. She contains qualities of both making her a truly remarkable specimen. So in other words, she is at the juncture between these prosimians and these wonderful anthropoids that we are today, or are we a development of both? So she, she, she is with, within, she's sort of this, this missing link. She's got both qualities. Is she the missing link? Germany, 47 million years ago. And um, you hear the following, folks. They migrated to Africa. But we'll leave that one. So where, do you know what I mean? There's, there's all these different arguments. So what we've got, we've got various natural history museums. And the one in Oslo believes her physical size and diet was similar to the eastern woolly lemur. Um, a wet nosed primate native at, to Madagascar, but we've already said she had she had dry nose characteristics. However, Ida doesn't possess two key lemur traits: a tooth comb or a grooming claw. So, in other words, she doesn't have claws. She's got fingernails like us, rounded. They're rounded. See. A tooth comb is a set of fused forward angled teeth in the lower jaw that lemurs use to groom their fur. So, so you've got the tooth comb and the grooming claw, two, two different things that lemurs have that our primate Ida doesn't have. So she's not really a lemur either. So this, this long claw or second um, toe that they're they're talking about the grooming claw is something that Ida doesn't have. Ida also has a tarsus bone in her ankle that is shaped like a dry nose prime, primate um, ancestors. So Ida also has a tarsus bone in her ankle that is 
shaped like a dry nosed primate ancestor, not the nose of a primate ancestor, but there you go, it's ankle. It's very similar to <coughs> pri modern primate ankles. That's what we're talking about. So very interesting creature indeed. Can we just stop a minute? Just, 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 just stop. Gotta stop, got to stop. Because when we go to something like Bristol Zoo, it's got these classifications, doesn't it? Lemurs come from Madagascar, um, apes come from Africa, elephants come from Africa and, and Asia, and these creatures come from that place and all the rest of it. We, we, go, we go back to our Bristol Zoo or our pen scanner or somewhere like that, and we, 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 we always look at these categories, and, and it's so difficult to break out of these categories. But tortoises. Galapagos, Charles Darwin, apes, multi-regional, tortoises. Now, last week, we saw a tortoise in the Bahamas. Tortoises also live on the Galapagos Islands. Tortoises also live in Asia. They also live in, they also live in the likes of Spain. You can find them in Africa as well. Tortoises are everywhere. So are humans. That's the point. Tortoises can't swim. And I don't think a human would be able to swim over to Africa either. Or all, all, all these uh, swim over to America from Africa either. So what I'm trying to get at is that um, when, when we look at evolution, it's almost as if certain, right, we'll do it this way. This, this is quite an easy, this is what we, we, we looked at on Tuesday. Fish. Fish come out of water and dry land become dry land animals and we all evolve like that. Agreed? Yes, that's what we're always told. Fish are in the sea all the way around the planet. They're in the lake, lakes all the way around the planet. They're everywhere. So if, if, if certain fish come out of the water millions of years ago where modern day Australia is today and, and they wander out of the water somewhere where Africa is today and they wander out the water in, in, in America, right? They, these creatures evolve into different things. They eventually develop into flying beasts and, and lizards and everything develops out of these creatures coming out of the water. They, they, they develop differently in different areas, but there's no reason why you can't have a tortoise developing thousands of miles away from another type of tortoise developing in equally the same distance. And there's every reason to say that humans developed in the same way. It's called determinism. Even with humans today, we determine what we do. Good example, maybe it's a poor example, Second World War. There was no science, scientists linking the development of the atomic bomb in Russia with scientists developing the atomic bomb in Germany and scientists developing the atomic bomb in America. But they developed at the same time. And, and it, I know that's a probably bad, bad example, bad metaphor, and you can say I'm wrong. But what I'm trying to get at, these scientists unlinked were able to develop the same technology in different parts of the world. And that's how I'm looking at human evolution, multi-regional, just looking at the tortoise. And in an, an isolated tortoise on the Galapagos Island is, is practically the same as a tortoise in Spain, but there are some de determining differences in characteristics. It's very likely that we've got evolution similarly across the earth leading to similar species. And that's what we're talking about. That happens. And why can't it happen? You look at, you look at the likes of frogs and, and toads. Frogs and toads are all over the planet, folks. And they're very delicate creatures. But they all develop two back legs, two front arms. They're very slimy little beasts and they live in water and land. <laughs> Missing link between water and the land. Why? not look i'm not saying i'm right i invite you to disagree with me I invite you to discuss more I invite you to tell me i'm wrong 
You can tell me I'm wrong. Come up with an argument. I'm okay. I can be wrong, but I'm not wrong on this evidence. I'm not wrong on what I'm seeing. This is archaeological evidence. The same evidence somebody would argue out of Africa. Now, I think it's great. I think it's great that the Leakey family worked from the 1920s even through to today to find the evidence from the old of I gorge. I think it's wonderful because they work day in, day out. And it's brilliant. But that's what we do as scientists. We go out and we find the evidence. We work over, we, 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 we try and find the evidence. But as I've already argued, if you had the same input of science and an unbroken broken line of research, you would have found the same in China and other parts of the world. They would be out of China as there is out of Africa. But unfortunately, China has seen various changes and they weren't able to do that with China. And the same is said for Germany. If, <laughs> and only if, there was no rise in the Nazi party, and if the Germans had thankfully have won the First World War, we might have seen scientific advances with that age of peace. Just think, if there'd been no First World War, we would have been using computers decades earlier. We would have, we would have been going to the moon decades earlier, but we squandered the wealth of humanity at the beginning of the First World War. And maybe scientists would have been looking in Germany and extended that research in China. And at the same time, we would have seen multi-regional developments and scientific findings of primates all the way across the earth. We squandered it. And now we're the type of planet that is always at war with each other. Learn from our past, folks. So this transitional species, a link between prosimian and anthropoidal primates. Other scientists disagree with this conclusion. They say this is not the missing link. So the archaeologist Hurum frequently speaks about Ida and other fossils to school groups. He says Ida attracts more questions from girls than boys. And more questions from girls than boys. That's really interesting. Girls are interested in how Ida lived, what she looked like, what she ate, how she moved, how she coped with a broken wrist. And boys are obviously interested more into dinosaurs, aren't they? And and one and the thing is, you see, and this is this is rather important. This is rather important. The girls like to want to know more about their origins than boys. Boys are interested in dinosaurs and claws and ripping creatures and all these all these things. And the and this leads us to a problem. When most of these primates have been found, they've been found by males and there's usually a different narrative and there's usually a very masculine narrative. narrative. And that masculine narrative has to be that we are always right as men, white men, and we are, we are very much saying that, that everything evolved from one locality. Women, women seemingly think differently. And, and and Ida, and also to girls, Ida doesn't have that bloody backdrop that modern day uh, dinosaurs um, offer for boys. So actually, you know, I'm going to stop there on Darwinius Masele. I'm going to actually stop there. That's enough. That's enough information. That's enough indoctrination. That That's an, enough on Ida. So... Let's let's sort of um, go on, but again, love these images. I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take um, a drink a minute. So there's our reconstruction, and there we go. 
She's going to be from, um, there's Frankfurt on the plan. Obviously, I said it was South Central Germany, more Central Germany than um, South Central. And what we do find in the north, we find the Neander Valley. In the south, we look at one of the other finds. So these founds are being found, found all the way across Germany. Now, there's another point here, rather interesting point. If Germany had ceased to exist after the Second World War, which is quite possible, we wouldn't be talking about fines being found in Germany. We would be talking about fines being found in a greater France or a greater Poland or a greater Czech Republic. Would that make a difference? Would it make a difference? Wouldn't it take away Germany's past for these finds to have been discovered in Austria, for example, or Belgium? I think the answer is yes, because there's always an ingrained bias towards Germany. It's always as if Germany has to always apologize for the Second World War. German archaeologists are very good archaeologists and they're not biased. They're a lot more scientific than our archaeologists. And they're a lot more dedicated to what they're doing because they've got a lot more to prove. But do they continually have to prove themselves to be better than everybody else when in fact they are? Do, do, they, do they always have to apologize? The answer is they don't have to apologize. G evidence in Germany is equally as good as evidence anywhere else on the planet. Now, looking at this family tree, and I know... I know Goff will want to go soon. So what we'll do, Goff, if you're still with us, we'll um, no. we'll look no. at this. We'll look no. at this. Yeah, good. And um, we'll look at this chart and we'll introduce the next find and then we'll have a break. So we're looking at the order of primates. So we've got on the left-hand side, <laughs> if we can get my little thing in, lemurs, Madagascar. So if we, if we look at this and we think of 65 million years ago, and we sort of come in with this baseline of about 47 million years ago, some, somewhere, um, somewhere along this line, we have our friend, uh, Darwinius Masele. This is, this is where we've got Ida. So what we're saying, um, she's got similarities with lemurs and she's got similarities between monkeys. Are we talking about somewhere there? And if we're talking about let's do an X marks the spot. If we're talking about that point, then she becomes the garden of our primate evolution. Where do we go next? Do you know where we go next for the next part of this installment? We go there about 12 million years ago. In fact, this next piece of evidence is equally as fascinating as the evidence before. And we've got some really nice images to look at that as well. But, but when we look at this chart, what we do see is a load of apes, a load of prosimians, a load of primates. And to be honest with you, there are lots of missing links. Remember when we look at these quarry finds and we look at the Chinese finds and we look at the African finds, there are only ever one or two sets of bones found. It's a bit like dinosaurs, is it not? On the planet, we will only ever know from the geological evidence of about 5% of the dinosaurs that ever existed on this planet. 5%. That's all we'll ever know. 5%. So I know this is closer in time. This timeline going back 65 million years ago, dinosaurs became extinct 66, 65 million years ago. <clears throat> And we'll only ever know 5% of the 
of all those dinosaurs that existed. Will we ever really know this primate tree? Will we ever have the evidence that we're finding in Germany again anywhere else on the planet? The answer is yes, but it only represent a small percentage of those missing links. Missing link? Everything's a missing link. And as we look at human beings today, as humans have evolved into where we are today, there are never two humans alike. Twins, for example, there's always differences between those two twins. There's always some differences. They can never be exactly the same. And the reason why they can't be exactly the same is we've have evolved from so many different strands from out of that watery out of that watery landscape we come evolving across this great primeval pangea this supercontinent and and we all converge and everything breaks away and sort of that determinism that sort of development and to be honest with you if we want to really be a, a multicultural world we have to embrace this multicultural archaeology that we're finding do you know i i um I've, I'm, I'm actually, we're coming out with another Romans in the Vale of Gamorgan book. It's going to be updated, new cover and all the rest of it, right? And lots of people say that that I'm I'm rather biased. I'm, I'm rather biased. I've got, I always say that the Romans offered this and the Romans did this. And if it wasn't for the Romans, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. Well, I actually also say that if the Romans hadn't come over to Britain 200 years later, we would have started to develop towns and cities. We already had a coin economy developing before the Romans come over here. We would have had our own brand of Christianity. Yes, the Romans advanced us 200 years earlier th than we would have. And when the Romans were here, they took as much from us as we took from them. And the point I'm trying to make is that the past is very complicated. And by looking at these primates, this is even more complicated again. And we're going to look at those bonobos later. The, look, look at them. They, don't they look beautiful? They really do. Uh, my little friends behind me, they look they're wonderful. We're going to look at these after the break. Um, and what we're going to do is look at these bones. And these bones take us back to 12 million years ago. And this dating back 12 million years ago, was the article that wonderful Kathy brought in on the uh, that day. It was dated the 6th of November, 2019. And um, it probably wasn't Kathy, but naturally Kathy has to get the credit for something because she hasn't been allowed to talk today. So I have just done one whole hour. And, and what I would like to do is I'd like to stop the sharing. And I would like to, I'd like to hear from Goff actually. And I would like to hear whether he agreed with me and what he felt about everything. So over to you, Goff. Yeah, it's very good. And it's hard for me to get my head around the fact that you're looking at that little creature 47 million years ago and what I looked at in the mirror this morning. <laughs> Well, I've known women like that. <laughs> Fascinating. Nothing but teeth, Goff. <laughs> so, um, talking about nothing but teeth, Chris. <laughs> it's very interesting. That's Goff. Cool. Um, what, 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 what about this one? Talking about legs. What have you got to say, um, Keith? Oh, he's... Oh, he, I tell you what, he's, he's not playing games today, is he? He's a very shy. Pamola. No, no, I, I don't believe it. Nobody wants to say anything. I tell you what, we'll do the gobby one next. And do you know what? She goes straight, she goes straight to it, right? Go on, Sue. <laughs> As a gobby person, I can only say that... You know, I'm delighted to be related to somebody who was quite quiet all those millions of years ago. I don't know what to say. 
<laughs> and, and talking about talking about not being quiet, right? This is where Goth puts his fingers in his ears, right? Here we go, go for it. And me. No. It... Oh, hang on, go on, Pam. <laughs> you know, evil. See no evil. <laughs> right, let's move on. Um, Andrea, <laughs> anything from you guys? Yeah, we. We can't understand why we ever lost the tails. We think it would have been very handy to have kept <laughs> the tail as we developed. I mean, I really just... So we can't understand how, when we evolved, you know, why would we have lost our tails? <laughs> That's such a handy addition to have. And I'm not sure I've ever seen them any monkeys with uh. blue eyes either. <laughs> can, I, can, I just, um, can I just stop you a minute? Um, Arnold, of, Arnold of Todi in Italy in the 1400s argued that Englishmen have tails, and and, and that's what he said. He used to in his in it, he used to say that Englishmen have tails. So, has anyone ever seen an Englishman naked? Because yeah. that'll answer. Ah, that's it. <laughs> Englishmen have tails. That's a fact. <laughs> Get your kit off. Oh. <laughs> Hang on a minute, you cheeky bastard! I'm actually from here. <laughs> I'm actually from Glad. I'm I'm Cymru. Right, anything else you want to say? <laughs> Where do the blue eyes come into it? What's that? Where do the blue eyes come into it? I don't know any monkeys with blue eyes. I do. I'm not saying any more. I, I well, don't know. I, I but actually no. You 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 get the nice sort of um bluey type hues in the eyes and the uh, yeah, you can, yeah. Um, and when I think the oh, Anna Nervé would hidden Ida as much as they could because they wouldn't have wanted to be descended from something that looked like that. Yeah. Do, do, That's do not I, a master. I, I, That's I, a month. I, 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 actually, there's, 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 there's no joke in that at all. I, I completely agree with Kathy's sentiment. That's what I was trying to get across earlier on. Can, can, you, can you imagine... Can you imagine the conversation between Himmler and Hitler? But Hitler getting really excited. Look at what I found. And Hitler saying, oh, my God, I'm supposed <laughs> to stand at Nuremberg, tell people we've evolved from a two foot long thing that looks like a cat with a huge tail. No, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Yes, but Carl, they would have said that uh, Ida had a Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I don't know what to say about that. Right, so um, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a lovely break now. Goff, are you are you join are you leaving us now, darling? Yeah, I gotta go now. See you next week, darling. I'll see you next week. I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. See you soon, Goff. Bye. 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 -bye. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you what, right? I'm gonna leave the cat. Do you know what I should do, right? Um, the next time the job Wookie. Wookie Caves comes up, right? I'm gonna pay. I know I'm actually gonna take Karen all the way down to the Wookie Caves, right, to see if she gets the job because it's based on a cackle. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. That's not as good. It's not as good as Karen. Carl, it's really not. What? What? If Go it on. was from the collectors, a, a collector, then how do they know it definitely came from where it did in Germany? Yes. Ah, yes. uh, the rock, the rock. End of. Uh, I I told you about the geological testing of the rock. That's how they found it was. It was the rock. All right. Okay. So uh, so on that note, what it could have been, right? It could have been one of Hitler's stash. I'm I'm moving on. Right. I I know Andrea's got German um, origin, so I won't say anymore. I'm going to take a break now. E. <laughs> Yeah, mine are, mine are all right, so we got after after the break we're we're from back after the break after we've had our cups of tea and there i am still drinking my tea so keith i do believe you had a little bit of a question for me i was just gonna say um is this the only time we've found an ida i mean i presume she's the only one and there's no more around in europe that we've found so far does that mean that we just miss them there's a dual edge edge answer. When, when we look at Lucy, for example, in Africa, 
Um, we look at Old Dubai. We look at her 3.2 million year old remains. There has other bits and pieces been found, but that 40% of her remains is the best that we've got from that age. Obviously, this, this 47 million year old set of remains from Germany is the only complete set of remains. And up until reading my notes, it was the only one that had been found. However, I am, I am happily, um, I am hap a happy remark was made by Kathy to say that in fact, um, another partial set of remains of the same species are actually been found. So it's a lot more than Lucy and it's a lot more than Lucy again. And this is from a lot earlier period. So, and it's a quarry that lots of other evidence has actually come from. And we do find that in other locations such as Spain and other localities in Europe, there have been lots of other hominid remains actually found. So it, it's not it's not by any chalk of the imagination the only one. There, there are others out there from, and um, when we think about it, there will be many, many more found over the years. It's just, I think it's just a matter of, of not by chance anymore because all of these finds that we're talking about in Germany have been found by chance. You know, they, they find the quarry sites and they find things there by accident yeah. and the archaeologists yes. move in. But that's because these the, this evidence has been found by chance in the first place. So, yeah, so, so that's really, really interesting stuff. So the image that we've got in front of us is actually relating to this massive piece of news that I come across in November. It, it was it was amazing, absolutely amazing that we've got something like this, and it stopped me in my tracks. But again, this this stuff with um, Ida is is only within just just within a, just over ten years previous, and I, I knew nothing about that. Which, um, but this is headline news: a new find. And then we've got another find. When you're doing um, when you're doing a presentation like this, you always get people saying, "Oh, did you know about this?" And I thought, "No." And apparently, um, in October, a few weeks back, another found find was found in Germany. So it's it's likely that there's a lot more out there that either hasn't been reported or has been reported or has been missed. And yeah, set with our uh, yeah, and knowing where to look and all these other things. So private collections. This was in a private collection and it only became public in 2006. So how many other artifacts like this are in private collections? Because they know that the um, they know that the experts are going to want, want to get their hands on them. And and this is what science does. So obviously the next find is related to our two little friends here. Uh, Bonobo um, apes and we've we've got this is very important so we've i i fleetingly mentioned it earlier on about our ida being able to be upright and to be able to walk now this is it was said that lucy was the first evidence of an upright hominid 3.2 million years ago we've got this upright mm -hmm. semi upright hominid with the tail could stand up, that's going to 47 million years ago. Well, this one, 12 million years ago, is equally millions of years earlier than, than our friend in Africa. And the upright gait is really important. If you think of a four-legged animal, jump it can sort of jump into a tree. But whenever you look at a four-legged animal getting down from a tree, you can always, particularly with a cat or a dog, you can always see it looking down at the ground thinking if I land there will will anything happen to my limbs if I land there my limbs are going to be okay so this is this is something that a four-legged animal has to think about every time when it comes down from a tree but a two-legged animal animal can come down from a tree much simpler than a four-legged animal so two legs is better than four legs so it's it's this it's this very story that we're going to go into now. So what I'm going to do is show you some bones. So have headline news thanks to Kathy and um, have they finally found the real missing link? Twelve million year old fossil remains, and they didn't only just find 
one set of fossil remains. They found four sets of fossil remains of one species and up to within the area, loads of other different uh, hominid remains and so on. 15, no, 15,000 bones. That's a lot of hominids. That's a lot of human remains. This one's... <clears throat> This one comes from the mountainous region of Algai in Germany. It's known as Duvius Guggenmosi. And broad chested, lived 12 million years ago, unique walking style, upright gait. It would have both swinged from tree, trees and, limb, and its limbs uh, look very similar to human limbs and would have walked upright. Is this a missing link? Now, Always do we hear this word missing link and missing link between humans and our ape-like ancestors. But that sounds as if it's very uniform in its statement. This, this, this find itself is from Bavaria, the, the, the border between Austria and Germany. So this one's now in the south. So we've got the one find from Frankfurt. We got the one find from Bavaria. So they spread all the way around Germany. And that point I made just before the break, if Germany has ceased to exist, then these things would be found in different countries today. And maybe we'd be, would we, would, we would be talking in a different way. So ape and human all in one. So our friend earlier, earlier on, uh, proto-simian, um, um, anthropoidal, um, upright gait, um, all in one. And Keith, I do believe we got a little bit of feedback on your line. So I'm just going to... Yeah, if you could do that for me, Keith, that would be very grateful. I don't know what's happening with your mic today, but Keith, you were my star pupil a few months ago, and now look at you. The discovery provides the first image of what the last common ancestor of apes and humans looked like, with fossils from this period being rare. Now, fossils from this period being rare, and there are thousands of them. It's a bit like looking at the Homo erectus um, in regards to Peking Man. Thousands of bones there. So Danuvius Guggenmosi is named after a local river god. So now this, this beast itself, the find of the broad-chested primate also pushes back the timeline for when walking on two feet began. So pushes it back beyond Lucy. And it's not, it's not, and the other thing as well, the one thing, the one thing that is being said throughout all this is that this is another evolutionary direction. There's nothing, you know, the Germans are keeping competing with the Africans and all the rest of it. it it's, it's that thing that, you know, the multi-regional model. So extended limb clambering, they describe this technique as both a combination of both swinging from branch to branch and walking on the ground. It's said, <coughs> even though this beast is much shorter than us, it's just over three and a half feet in height. It weighed five stone. Well, actually, my grandmother weighed five stone when she passed away two years ago. So, you know, she's a hominid. And my grandmother was under five foot tall. So I don't think size has got anything to do with it. I think, I think the main thing is we've got this um, primate species. A missing link. It is a missing link. The Germans are saying it is a missing link as much as the Africans are saying Lucy's a missing link as well. It was astonishing for us to realize how similar certain bones are to humans and opposite to great apes. So this is going into the human line more than anything. And they're saying, the German archaeologists are saying that personally was most surprised by the amount of Danuvius similarity in the back and shin bones. In, um, and this is, this is what we're looking at. This is totally unexpected to all of us. Danuvius is like an ape and a human all in one. <clears throat> the ape-like features are the slightly elongated arms like bonobos, but not as long as a gorillas or uh, gibbons and the um, opposo, um, opposable big toe. But even its elbow joints is not like great apes and resembles humans and small apes. So it's looking more like us every moment. 
and it it would have been able to hang on branches by its arms as well as walk upright. So it's got it's got everything. And and here we come in with the other thing: hair, body hair. Now it, it's it's when did we lose and why did we lose our hair? It's not to do with clothes. And we've mentioned why that is. We've got hairs under our armpits and we wear clothes. So it can't be to do with clothes. It's just like, like an evolutionary change. However, unlike other apes, such as gibbons and orangutans, which do not use their legs as much as their arms for locomotion, this species had hind limbs that were held straight and could have been used to walk on. So this is the evidence we're looking at. So not from one example, but from a number of examples. This ape also had a grasping big toe, which um, meant it would have walked on the sole of its feet. So there you go. It's looking better and better every time. So these are these are some of the bones. So what we've got, we've got, we've got the, um, we've got the, I was going to be really complicated there and come up with the, the name for um, hand bones, uh, but it just went out of my head. So we've got the finger bones there. We've got the spinal bones. We've got this, this itself quite nicely uh, would look like something like a, um, a humerus. And you might look like some of these, some of these, this, this bone itself looks something very similar this is a leg bone, so this is our tibia. So all of these bones look very hum hominid-like, but, uh, uh, yeah, the word I was looking for was phalanges, wasn't it? So for, for the hand and the, um, and the feet bones, the carpals and the tarsals, it all comes to your back eventually. But these bones look very hominid-like, and this being found at a very interesting juncture in trying to understand hominid origins, a broad chest, long spine. I mentioned about the long spine with our Ida earlier on. Extended hips and knees, as with all animals that walk on two feet, including humans. So what we've got with this evidence, it, the rock type that we find there dates back to 16 to 5 million years ago. So we've got a chronology of geological stroke archaeological paleontological evidence within this one site the bones the bones that they've been finding listen to this folks including jaw bones so some of the bones that you're finding in front of you are only some of the bones the bones came from at least four individuals a male two females and a juvenile and they included not only teeth but also parts of the skull jaw rib cage spine along with arm, leg, finger, and feet bones. So we've got a good assemblage from four individuals. So not only does that make this a, represent, a representation of a species, but an adequate representation of a species. The problem is when, when archeologists just find one or two bones of a hominid, other archeologists always come in and say, how do you know that's not a deformity? How can you win an argument like that? So with all the other bits and pieces, it really helps us understand what these creatures look like. So what we got now is as we move on again, there's there's our site, um, Al a guy um, in the mountain range between Germany and Austria. That's completely the wrong pronunciation. I'm sure somebody can correct me on that. And look at this one representation, reconstruction of a skull. Can you see a few things with that reconstruction of the skull? The few things are as follows. So if we if we go nicely in there, the and let's draw. Look at that there. You can see a flat face developing, which is a human characteristics. And what you can see is that the the muzzle is actually retreating. So that's actually going into the skull like a human skull, but it's, it's still protruding there. You've got these wonderful molars. You've got molars. A nice jawbone. It's quite a thick jawbone, actually, but it's getting there. So you've got you've got the molars, you've got the canines, and you would naturally have our wonderful incisors. So this is the, the jawbone is looking very human every time. Very, very interesting that. And as we sort of 
again, if we, we move on to another image, there it is, there's the reconstruction of one of the individuals there. And we're, and in, in, in many ways, yeah, you're looking at reconstruction of one individual. And if you want to compare this with the Lady of Pavilion Cave, which you know my thoughts on the Lady of Pavilion Cave, there's as many bones being found in regards to the Lady of Pavilion Cave as in regards to some of these remains dating back to nearly 12 million years ago. Amazing, that, and absolutely amazing. So as we, as we sort of go back into what I'm reading, the adult male's skeleton was so complete that the researchers were able to describe its limbs and body proportions in detail. That is very important. It's not just a fluke. It was similar in size to modern day bonobo, bonobos that we've got behind me. Thanks to completely preserved limb bones, vertebra, finger and toe bones, we were able to reconstruct the way Danuvius moved about its environment. Importantly, for the first time, we were able to investigate several functionally important joints, including the elbow, wrist, hip, knee and ankle in a single fossil skeleton of this age. From the skull, we have found the left part of the face. We could estimate a stature a little more than one metre, one and a half metres in height. Females weighed about three stone and males five stone. Bloody hell. I don't know how that worked. Um, Danuvius would have had a powerful grasp and flat human-like feet for walking. It also had a mobile wrist and hands with curved fingers. Knuckle walkers like chimpanzees, bonobos and gorillas lack the extended knee and have less developed grasping, but these had a good grasp as well. Grasp of the figures. The fingers of Danuvius also lack the robusticity typical of knuckle walkers. So in other words, they were thin and spidery like ours. But obviously what we don't have is, is the true evidence of the rounded fingers. And, you know, obviously it's not got claws because this is actually all in a um, lithified form in, in a, in a, um, in, in a geological form. So we're missing that detail, but nevertheless, there's so many similarities, small body size. So it's not like a large ape. That's very, very important. Based on the shape and size, we're able to work out how it moved around. So we got some nice, nice other little bones here. So we're going to, I'll show this image. Nice, some nice box bones there. And uh, don't they look great? So hang on a minute. I've just, um, I've got a little problem there. So, so the emerging picture of this, if it's the locomotion, is different from any known living creature. Even though it looks like the bonobo, it's, it's not, it's very different. Living primates either favour their arms or their hind limbs. These seem to favour both. So, um, yes, our last common ancestor with great apes did not look like a chimp or any living great ape. He may have looked like Danuvius. Now, one thing that I used to see, I used to look at those old books on how Homo habilis was portrayed. Now, Homo habilis... Again, another human ancestor about 2.5 million years ago. Every illustration of a Homo habilis used to look like this. But this is an illustration of a hominid that lived 12 million years ago. So it, it seems that every time the, the book, the pages go back, it's almost like starting in a diary in January 2000, 2020. You start your first entry. Hello, I woke up, had a meal, went to sleep, right? And then somebody comes around and says, actually, you did something before January. There's December. So you start writing about December. Actually, this is what I did in December. And then strangely enough, you got January. And by the time you know it, you're back into 2018. This is what th this looks like. You can't, you can't, it's almost as if you've lost your memory and suddenly you're able to put your steps further back. And in many ways, that's what archaeology is like now. There's always these new way, there's always these new things being found. 
they turned the clock back further and further. And the difference is with a diary and a clock is that a clock is absolute. If you're convinced that a clock is absolute, then you'll always believe there's 12 hours um, in the morning and 12 hours in the afternoon and there's 24 hours in a day. However, we've added a 25th hour and the 26th hour in a day. So it, it, it's, it, it's really bloody difficult to get your head around that. I, I, I don't know if it was um, Goff who, he, who ever said it was difficult to get a mind around it. And I think he was joking at that point. But something was said to me yesterday. They said, what about other colours um, that we don't really know about? And I'm thinking, I, I can't I can't get what you're saying. What if there's other colours on the spectrum that we don't know about? We don't we can't describe them. And I just can't get my head around that. So this is what this is like to some people. You can't get your head around it because everything that we've been taught is wrong. And it's the same with somebody who follow. It's the same with somebody who reads the Bible. You know, they, they, they believe in the New Testament and the Old Testament and there's nothing else. Um, and then somebody turns around and said, actually, you know, when when God is creating the earth in six days and he rests on the seventh or whatever, the concept of time in the Bible, a million uh, one day might represent a billion years. And you think, oh, that makes sense. So it's, it's a different. There's also a different way of looking at things. That's the point I'm trying to make. Danuvia shows us the conditions from where both great apes and humans diverged and this evolutionary process. This evolutionary process happened in Europe. And I've got a check in there. It's one of the places where this happened. Back to what we said at the beginning. So let, let's look at um, let's look at some spinal bones. And I'll get the next image up there. Now I, I've worked. Oh, oh, look at that there. Little finger bones. It's great, isn't it? Right, now I've excavated these, and obviously on a human concept, it's great. You know, wonderful, wonderful. And look at these spinal bones there. Um, I have excavated spinal bones like that. And, and if I if I found this in, in a grave somewhere, anywhere in Britain, that would be a human a spinal bone. So the, the upper vertebra. Um, and you, you're just you're just looking and it, there's no difference to our spinal bones and these spinal bones. Let's, let's just go get let's just go back to the, the, that finger the um phalanges there and there we go so if, if we if we look at that there and i sort of go back to my notes again sort of kicking on that so the researchers may answer the questions of what kind of early locomotion underlies our bipedal origins why we started to walk why is it because we needed to get down from trees what is it is it because it's easier being on on two legs rather than all four um if you start to invite in tools for example tools in your hands and you've got your feet and that's an interesting way and don't we see woodpeckers they, they've got their two little legs on a tree and they're using their beak well that's the beak itself is the woodpecker's arms like we've got it that, that's the, the it's using that as a tool and and it, it's so much easier using two arms with tools than it is being on all fours trying to use tools it, it's a you know even animals that try to use their arms like a cat when it's playing, it sort of goes like this, right? It doesn't do this on all fours. So maybe that's a way, but we don't really know why we started walking upright. If we were able to work, if we were able to work out why we started walking upright whenever, it's taking those first steps from the trees onto the terrestrial landscape. There's something missing here. But then again, folks, that's why they call it a missing link. So, hang on a minute. Oh, I had a little, 
I had a little map there precisely of where we've got, but it's it's on my notes. But don't worry, we know where we are. We're in we're in the southern part of Germany. So what I'm going to do now, before we go on to the next bit and the last bit today, well, it's not exactly the last bit, we go on to the Neanderthals. I'd like to give you a few projected facts, right? Now, th this is, um, this sort of covers everything that we've done, but then again, it doesn't. It's sort of, it's sort of an, an overview. So 55 million years ago, first primitive primates evolve. Yeah, we've sort of seen that today in Germany. <coughs> And also Africa. Let's go back to Africa a minute. Yeah, um, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. We do actually have early primates in Africa, but the best primate evidence that we found is actually in Germany. So is that me being competitive? No, it's not. Let's be clear. You've got early primates of this date uh, being found in Africa, but not as well preserved 47 million years ago. Let's make that clear. OK. So 15 million years ago, we 15 to 12 million years ago, we start to see a great leap. Seven million years ago, we start to see um, the, the divergence. Seven million years ago. 5.5 million years ago, we start to see proto-human straits, whatever that means. And then we start to look at Africa again, four million years ago, ape-like early humans, the Australopithecines appear. Well, that's wrong because we see something very different in Germany. And that's my folks, where we're gonna diverge. Just a few other things. And then, then we're looking at 2.7 million years ago, Paraanthropus, paraanthropus, a, a pre-homo, homo habilis, a, a, a post-Australopleicene. Paraanthropus lived in woods and had massive jaws for chewing. Well, yeah, well, we, we're seeing this anyway. 2.6 million years ago, hand axes become the first major technological e in innovation. Hands, hand axes, maybe we're going to see hand axes much earlier. Homo habilis. 2.5, 2.3 million years ago, uh, developing in Africa, Homo habilis. And then we then we look at that sort of African tree, Homo erectus, 1.8 million years ago, and then everything else is known, or is it? No, it's not. So what I'd like to do now is go on to a tooth. One single tooth, actually two teeth, but I got one to show you, that big tooth. Take a slurp, that molar. It tells like it looks like one weird type of fruit that you get in Tesco's. And if you ever do see a strange fruit like this in Tesco's, don't eat it. So let's let's look at my last but one set of notes. We're going to do the Neanderthals fleetingly, but that's because but we're going to be still in Germany. So headline news. 4th of October 2020. Everyone missed it in their newspapers. How dare all of you? How dare me? My God, I was shocked myself. 9.7 million year old ancient teeth found in Germany belong to mystery, mystery primate. Different part of Germany, Keith, different part. So the discussion over the understanding of our early history was opened up in was opened up in 2006 was opened up 2017 these notes say and opened up for public viewing this well when i say this year the year's gone so fast hasn't it um yes opened up this year in 2020 and 2019 by a team of german archaeologists in southwest germany so we go to southwest germany again and this, these teeth belong to an ancient Euro-Asian primate. Note the word Euro-Asian, strange term. The finds, finds more than one come from Eppelsheim in Germany. It's totally new to science and it's a big surprise because no one had expected such a tremendously rare find of these teeth the Eppelsheim site. And next, we show you the article I'm reading from. So let's let's sort of do a new screen share. Let's, um, 
Don't love it. Do you know some? You know? Do you ever get those blonde moments and you forget what you're doing? That's what I've got. So here we go. Are you seeing the article? Who is still with me? Are you still with me, Chris? Nobody's with me. Oh my god! <laughs> Can you see the image I've got? Can you see um, some lines and? Um, yeah. yeah, good. Actually, Chris, um, I don't want to admit it. I just wanted to hear your voice. <laughs> For 17 years where the, where the River Rhine used to flow, excavated riverbed settlements approximately 10 million years old. The area is well known in science and famous for its primate fossils. And just think of this. In the last second of the excavation, they find these two teeth. They aren't really, really expecting such a tremendous discovery. I had to do that without golf around because he would have killed me. So in other words, the Germans are actually finding more finds 9.7 million years ago. And you can Im imagine those wonderful German archaeologists and with foreign archaeologists as well from other countries, for verification. They're digging um, 10, 15 metres in depth into this pit. Now, again, this is one of those sites that obviously they, they, they've been working for 17 years. And the tooth that you're looking at, one of the teeth that you're looking at in front of you, excellent and shining like amber, as the archaeologists describe. These teeth themselves, there's a canine tooth and an upper molar, this being an upper molar, found only 60 centimetres apart, believed to be from an animal um, that existed 9.7 million years ago. And these teeth resemble animals that apparently left Africa 4.5 million years ago. However, the evidence tells us that these bones date to 9.7 million years ago, so they could not have left Africa. The, the nearest apes with teeth like this that left Africa were 4.5 million years ago. So you, you start to see the confusion in the dates now. It's a complete mystery where this individual came from, good word in, and why nobody ever found a tooth like this somewhere else before. Experts say that the teeth hardly force us to re-examine the theory that humans, uh, theory that humans originated from Africa, arguing that the fossils more likely belong to a very distant branch on the primate family tree. But there's a point there whether you want to agree with it or disagree with that last statement. The point is, and this is a very interesting thing, you would have never have believed that you had apes in Europe in the first place. Certainly when I was a child, I wouldn't have thought that you ever had apes in, in Europe. I, I, I just wouldn't think about it. I just, just really wouldn't. You know, apes come from Africa, don't they? But now we're seeing this evidence forcing us to reacquaint the evidence. And with the experts disagreeing with, with this archaeology, it really helps us to it really helps us to sort of examine it. And it really helps us to academically try to understand what's going on. The majority of experts in connection with these teeth from 9.7 million years ago said that the molar found likely belongs to a species of an extinct primate branch of primates that lived in Asia and Europe between 7 and 17 million years ago. And you know what? We're going to leave that there. And the reason why we're going to leave that there is I've, I don't want to repeat myself anymore. but what we want to do is go to the Neander Valley um, just briefly. And the reason why I want to go to the Neander Valley, we've got four sites in Germany that we've spoken about. There are many more that give us early evidence of our early human ancestors. But now we go to a more closer period in time. We're just going to go to the Neander Valley. And there you go. There's the Neander Valley in north. Can't see it, Carl. What's that? Can't see it. Do you know what? I'm glad you said that because <laughs> Keith wouldn't have uh, Keith and Goff wouldn't have said a thing. 
because both of them have fallen asleep. <laughs> Do you know what I think it is? Actually, Keith has fallen asleep. Oh, there it is. Out. Yeah. <laughs> so there's the Neander Valley in north eastern Germany. And what you can actually see is this is evidence of the Neanderthals. And you can see that, you know, you've got evidence of the Neanderthals at other sites in, in, in Spain and in the likes of all Yugoslavia, in the likes of Georgia and the Neander Valley. And, but back to the German theme as well. Again, this early evidence from Germany um, that was originally found in the Neander Valley in 1856. The Neander Valley, in where they actually found these remains, actually no longer exists because it was extensively quarried. And looking at this map again, um, where the Neanderthals actually come into this whole, this whole theme. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Neanderthals, just, just, just very, very briefly. And there's, there's a point about all this. So what I need to do is, for some reason, my screen seems to be locked in front of me. So I'm just going to find out why that is. And why is this happening? I've just got a technical problem a minute. And let's click something up a minute. Hang on a minute. We just mm. got a little problem. Excellent. Now, what, what we do know about is that the Neanderthals, um, when, when, we, when we study, when we look at the Neanderthals, the species are so-called the Neanderthals because they were found in the Neander Valley. And when they were initially found in the Neander Valley, there was a lot of discussion about who these early beings were because of their heavy frontal lobe, because of their large limbs, they were always made out to be rather thuggish. But these finds were made in Germany in 1856. And if they weren't found in Germany in 1856, it would be a few more decades before any similar Neanderthal bones would be found anywhere else. So the point of mentioning Neanderthals, I know they're not those early primates that we've been looking at, but the point to be made is that we've got so much of our early evidence coming from Germany itself and not only did they find one or two skulls from the Neander Valley, they found a number of skulls and a number of other limbs from the Neander Valley. And this overnight, Neanderthal man was the home to a whole new species that we didn't know existed up until that point. Now, what I'd like to say in, in closing today is that we've got so much information from Germany and we've got so much information from Asia and we've got so much information from Africa on early hominids and the development of the human tree and where humans are today. And I think from now on, if you see any headline news on any other hominid remains being found anywhere on the planet, they are very relevant and they are not to be dismissed. And mark my words, over the next year or so, some findings will be made in Mongolia, which will really change the whole picture of examining our human origins. And the multi-regional tree will definitely be up there. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna finish now and we're going to ask, are there any questions from anyone? Right, Keith, you go first. Nope, Chris, you go first. <laughs> well, Keith's still on mute. <laughs> hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Keith, babe. But Keith, you're very faint, like a little baby crying in a bath upstairs. Oh, well, sorry well, about Well, actually, that. no, that's really wrong. There's no water in a bath. Um, and there's a blanket in the bath and the taps are off and the baby's crying because it can't see out of the bath. 
<laughs> jelly good, jelly good. All I was going to say is, you know, we're suggesting uh, uh, oh, parallel yeah. evolution going on around the globe. Yes. Is there any sign of that happening in the Americas? No, not yet. But, but we we look at the boundary of America going back to thirty one thousand years ago. I'm, I'm the prediction has to be in the next five years we're probably going to see evidence in North America in the Americas going back to about fifty thousand years ago, right. and then the clock will start ticking. When we started looking at the Aboriginal evidence. We started looking about 10,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, 75,000 years ago. They're thinking about 120,000 years ago. It's, it keeps going back. And, right. um, and it's the same with Japan, and it's the same with all these different parts of the Earth. I can't and call... It's like the American election. I can't call it yet, but it's looking very interesting in America and the way things are going. It's going... Right. It's going very early. Up until a few years ago, Clovis, 14,000 years ago, was it. That's, the, that's where the line remained. But suddenly 15,000 years go by, 31,000 years ago, I keep going back. Yeah, so. Right. And mm -hmm. second point, if I may. Yeah. 47 million years ago, the world was a very different geological place than it is now. Yes. I, Europe was probably a lot more linked in with Africa. Yes. Yeah. And therefore, the temperatures were probably a lot different, probably a lot nearer the equator and all the rest yes. of it so apes were probably widespread across everywhere yes yes and it, it it doesn't it doesn't diverge away from that individual evolution because obviously at one point they would have had to have individually diverged and yes. then then looked all similar and came it's that it's that motion isn't it if you um if you put if you put if you put 20 monkeys in a room for 20 years they'll be able to um write the full works of shakespeare right it's the way things evolve, and it's, it's that direction. Yeah, okay, fine. So what we're going to do, we're going to go with Chris. Anything, Chris? Um, I just wondered how uh, DNA fitted in with this, because they, uh, they sort of used DNA to, to, to go back to, and they say we're all, you know, descended from one person in Africa. But as Keith pointed out, if there are apes all over the you know landmass then i suppose that would make sense but it wouldn't necessarily be african <laughs> uh, but but there is there is the other thing as well as there are millions of strands of dna we we only know some of them so yeah, yeah we, we can't we can't call that we just can't and the other thing as well is um we're actually all we're all descendant from fish and whatever and they all lived in the sea and, and you know there's all these different things I go with a multi-regional model. Whether other people do or not, that's up to them. But that's what I feel. Um, mm. Let's let's have. Oh God, I've muted them again. Oh God. Well, whilst they're unmuting, right? Um, Sue. No, I haven't got any questions. They've they've been asked very nicely by by other people. And finally, let's have Andrea, Jim, the Pope, Chris, and anybody else, and Kathy. Go for it. Who's your spokesperson? Oh. Oh, you can say that. Okay, one thing, one thing. I heard a rumour, right, that the missing link has been found living still in Merthyr Tidfil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was in Barry all this time. Oh, I'm from Barry. No, you are wrong. This is where we get biased. It's Barry. <laughs> So can I just mention next week, you've got to make sure you have a cake there and uh, that that's live. So if nobody has got anything else to say, thank you very much for your contribution today. What are we doing next week? We are doing the Indus Valley. Oh, Indus. Yes. Jolly we're good. Doing, Jolly good. We're, doing, we're going to have a look at the Indus um, civilizations, Indus Valley between Iran and India. That's what we're going to look at next week. Okay. Okay. So, so if there's nothing else anyone else likes to say, I'm going to thank you for joining us. We're finishing 10 minutes early today. Well, actually, we're still 25 minutes late, but we're getting there slowly. <laughs> so, um, so, yes, slowly. But if that's it, um, there's nothing else I need to say. I'll see you all next week. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, one Bye. last thing. One last thing. One final thing. I'm now an official YouTuber. I am now an influencer. I've got a thousand oh. subscribers. There you go. So, Sam, thank you very much. I okay. love you all to bits, including Jim and Keith, um, Chris, Sue, and Kathy, and 
Andrea and that <laughs> Uncle Co Tom Cobbley. Tom Cobbley. Bye bye, folks. Cheerio, bye. cheerio. Bye bye, Daddy. Bye bye, children. Bye bye, Daddy. Bye bye, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you need special needs. Yeah, see you, Chris. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much for joining me today. Another riveted lecture. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video today. And naturally, as I always say, if anyone would like to join my classes, then www.archaeologycumryonline.weebly.com. And any questions, anyone wants to say anything, they can agree, disagree, that's fine. As you, as you know, as you heard my video, um, I'm open to anybody's views on this subject. So this is Carl James Langford. Light is shining on my head. And um, thank you very much. Another lecture to do this afternoon. And thanks for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.